know, now I can name thousands of names uh, who are inspiring me because I think that every uh, Belarusian person who dared to challenge a uh, regime in our country is inspiring me. The first person, it was my husband who uh, started to oppose the, the, the regime, started to go from city to city asking people about their life. And when, uh, when he declared that he wants to participate in presidential election, elections, he was immediately detained. Then when uh, I... For Nigeria, the answer is we cannot sign up to this in the way it is now. But if there is improvement, we are on the table and we are interested in still joining. And the reasons for us are, one, the negotiation, contrary to the agreed rules, was not based on equal footing. The laws that evolved did not carry the views of a lot of countries along, so mostly what is met is are the views of the developed economies to the exclusion of most of our own countries. The current agreement also does not deliver on the underlying objective, and the rules are developed that are developed are so complex that it is difficult for us to cope with its with the implementation. So the rules need to be simplified. The pricing and the implementation are beyond our. Uh, our uh, our, need, our capacity to cope with right now. And also the narrowing of the scope of the rules that medium-sized digital uh, enterprises that dominate our markets are excluded. Most of the enterprises, digital enterprises in our countries are the medium-sized ones. They're, they're not the very, very uh, large ones. And the outcome of this means that there will be also discriminatory taxes within our own jurisdiction. So we will not be able, if we sign up, will not be able to tax uh, this medium size and small size businesses. While we are taxing similar companies that are Nigerian companies under in the, operating in the same market. So these are things that are important to us and need to be looked at. And maybe some variation of the rules or maybe uh, some stratification of the rules to meet the needs of developed countries. The agreement also seeks to prevent our countries from taking any step to tax thousands of out-of-scope uh, uh, digital, digital companies. And, and for us, that's where most of our revenues are right, right now. So we have issues that need to be looked at, and we hope that the rules that are currently designed to be pro-developed uh, countries will take into account the needs of uh, our countries. For example, the income inclusion rule and the ordering of the Pillar 2, which ensures that little or no taxation right is preserved for the source uh, countries. With this unfair design of the rules and the limitation of the scope to subject to tax rules, the IRR that will be used by developing countries, mm -hmm. by developed countries, will, will simply be used to mop up tax, taxes from our countries. And we will end up with very little or, yeah. or nothing at the end of the day. So these rules are important to have global yeah. rules, but it's also very important that the rules should be fair mm -hmm. and the rules should encourage tax equity mm -hmm. and as much as possible accommodate the various uh, variations of countries that are sitting on the table. Very clear. Uh, I will give you a chance to respond, but uh, first I want to go to Gabrielle. Uh, you've done a, a ton of work on global taxation. In November last year, you published a paper called global profit shifting, which has shown that profit shifting has dramatically increased since the 1970s, essentially when a multinational moves its profit from a high-tax jurisdiction to a low-tax jurisdiction. To what extent do you think the OECD proposal is going to stop that type of behavior? And 
I guess the same question to that as a follow-up is, are you expecting multinationals to change the way, the, the way they behave on back of this proposal? Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for the opportunity to be on, on this panel. And uh, <coughs> I want to start by saying that uh, this agreement is really a step in the right direction. Um, it's the first time that there's going to be an international agreement where countries agree on a minimum tax rate. We have many treaties that are about everything except tax rates, which is really what matters the most you know, for tax policy. It's going to make a real difference, especially Pillar 2, because many companies today pay less than 15% in taxes, mm -hmm. at least in some of the countries where they book profits. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because there's widespread profit shifting to tax havens. Mm -hmm. We estimate with my co-authors that each year almost 40% of global multinational profits are booked or shifted to tax havens where they are subject to very low tax rates you know, of 5% or so. So this agreement is going to make a difference. That being said, it's also very insufficient and it's also conceptually and philosophically flawed. It is insufficient because a tax rate of 15% is way too low. In many countries, uh, the, the ratio of taxes to total income is 30%, 40%, 50%, which means that most social groups, you know, the middle class, the working class, they pay 30, 40, 50% of their income in taxes. Now we are saying for multinational companies, it's okay to pay only 15%. Multinational companies, some of the most powerful economic actors, who've most benefited from globalization, it's okay for them to only pay 15%. Yeah. Ha it's very hard to understand mm. for, for people and for good reasons. So that's the, the first issue. The second issue is that in practice, uh, m multinational firms will still be able to pay significantly less than 15%. And the reason for that is the, the big conceptual problem with this agreement, which is that not all profits are going to be subject to 15% mm -hmm. There are carve-outs. There are carve-outs, yeah. which are very large. Mm -hmm. And I want to explain that very quickly because it's a, it's a really important philosophical question. And I'm, I'm going to explain exactly what I mean by that. The carve-outs mean that if you have uh, sufficient activity in a country, you employ people, you have assets, then the profits that derive from that activity are not subject to the tax, the 15% minimum tax, or at least not fully subject to the tax. The underlying uh, kind of philosophy behind that is that uh, tax competition, when it's real, you know, when it's real factors of production and employees, assets moving to low tax places, is legitimate, and there should be no floor to how low taxes can go. Even tax, tax rates of 0% are acceptable. And I think this is the big problem. This is the big problem because if uh, we keep having a form of globalization where there is no floor to tax competition, it means that who's going to keep benefit the most from globalization? Well, the most mobile factors of production, multinational firms, their shareholders, people who are at the very top of the income and the wealth distribution, and so it's going to fuel, you know, to keep fueling inequality. Mm -hmm. And eventually this is not sustainable. Yeah. So that's the, that's the big problem. Can I just ask you that two hundred twenty billion dollar that I mentioned at the beginning is is that can you contextualize it for us? Is that a decent sum to be raised from this type of overhaul? In it's 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 decent, and I I want to to stress again that I I, I do think that this is a step in the right direction. So mm -hmm. two hundred twenty billion dollars in extra revenue. And we obtained very similar you know, estimates in our own work in the context of the EU tax observatory. So we think this is realistic. That's almost 10% of global corporate income tax revenues. That's a significant amount of money. Yeah. That's for pillar two. Pillar one, you know, most likely will generate significantly less revenue. Uh, but for pillar two, we are, we are talking about significant revenues. And the reason for that, what it means is that you have many companies that pay much less than 15% today. Mm -hmm. uh, Last week, the Government Accountability Office in the U.S. released a report where they estimate that the effective tax rate for U.S. for large U.S. corporations after the 2018 tax reform in the U.S. has been 9 percent. 
9%. So, you know, it's below 15. Yeah. It means 15 is going to make some difference. But of course, the big problem is why only 15? Mm -hmm. There could be much well, more revenue if it was 20, 25. I want just to finish with that last thing. In the mid 1980s, the average statutory corporate income tax rate globally was above 45%. Mm -hmm. Today, we are around 20, 25%. Mm. Okay, and we are saying, well, there should be a minimum of 15%. But historically, we've been way, way above that. Okay, I'll come back to that. Faisal, I'd like to ask you about where is Saudi Arabia stand in terms of implementing this deal? And I think it's relevant because there is sort of um, a critical mass that's required for this deal to be successful. Is there a bit of a I'll go if you go mentality? <laughs> I'll, I'll be very frank with you. Saudi Arabia broadly supports this. Um, there are some details that need to be sorted out. But we broadly support this because uh, it stands, it's underpinned by the pillars of fairness. This is all about making sure that value and, and taxation are, are close to each other. And, and in that regard, I think uh, um, uh, in Saudi, uh, under Vision 2030, we've been focusing on detaching ourselves from the traditional sources of revenue with our economic diversification to think about more long-term sustainable uh, uh, revenue generation, but also diversifying our sources of growth. So this will, as a byproduct, uh, push governments to think about true fundamentals of competitiveness and competition at the same time. So this, this will drive productivity, this will drive competitiveness, this will take us away from the environment that had that race to the bottom mm. with being too attached to uh, fiscal incentives. Now, I agree we have to make sure everybody's at the table and listen to everyone. One thing we learned in the last seven years is that uh, voices are heard uh, and collaboration yields results. So broadly, we're, we're uh, uh, supporting this direction. We agree this is a step in the right direction. Uh, we feel that we have to stick to the time frame that's been set up with a multilateral agreement by mid-23, and, and implementation at uh, the start of 2024. <clears throat> Matthias, I'd like to go back to you. So there's a lot coming at you. <laughs> Namely, that you know, the, one of the criticisms of the deal is that there are many carve-outs. For example, I read on, on Pillar 1, once you adjust for all of the minimum thresholds, et cetera, you basically <coughs> end up with a very small pie of around 69 companies that will end up being taxed. That's, that's in Pillar 1. And the bulk of it is coming from US big tech firms. So it is a global deal, but in that, from that sense, a local impact. Uh, other pushbacks, we heard from Gabrielle saying that 15% is, is too low, and many, many concessions were not given uh, to represent African communities. How do you respond to all of these? Uh, well, <laughs> firstly, I mean, we've always said, and we still believe, that there's about 100 of uh, the world's largest, most successful multinational uh, corporations that are in scope uh, for for this deal, and uh, it is a very substantial uh, reallocation of uh, taxing rights. And, and and pillar two, as you as you've mentioned, uh, we expect now uh, to deliver 220 billion dollars uh, US per year in additional revenues, uh, mostly benefiting low and middle income uh, countries. Now, you know, some people have argued all the way through. Uh, instead of 15 percent, we should have 20 or 25 percent. But you know what? I mean, in the end, you've got to get consensus on something mm -hmm. that will be implemented. And 15% is substantially better than 0%. And, I mean, what we're trying to address here is, um, you know, a, a, a history now of uh, tax evasion and tax avoidance, which has become much easier uh, in a globalized, digitalized world economy. And, you know, in terms of uh, the uh, comments uh, that, that we made, I mean, we, we very much appreciate our work with Nigeria. Nigeria is uh, a deputy chair on the Inclusive Framework uh, Steering uh, Committee. Um, half of the members of the steering committee are developed economies. Um, more than half of the members of the Inclusive Framework are developing uh, economies. And uh, you know, these are the decisions in the Inclusive Framework are made by consensus. Now, that makes it more difficult, it makes it more involved, but and we are very committed. We will continue to engage uh, with Nigeria and with others in relation to some of the outstanding issues on which we still are yet uh, to reach consensus. Now, um, we, we do believe, though, that for countries like Nigeria, th this is an incredibly positive uh, deal that is on the table. I mean, Nigeria right now 
uh, has one of the lowest tax to GDP ratios in the world, 5.5%, 5.56%. Across the OECD, on average, it's um, 34%. Across African countries in the broad, it's about 15, 16%. Now, we believe that both under Pillar 2 and Pillar 1, as currently designed, the Nigerian government will have substantially more revenue available to deliver uh, investment, uh, public services, and social protection to its population. Mm. Now, it's true. I mean, we can continue to have uh, an argument uh, you know, around the world for a very long time that will never reach a landing. And we remain stuck at a level where we say, OK, we want the perceived perfect instead of pursuing the achievable good that's on the table. What, what I'm suggesting is this, this is... This is a deal that has, the pros that has the most realistic prospect of any other deal on the table mm. to actually make a tangible positive difference. Let's make it happen. Yes, let's continue to work constructively and in good faith through some of those technical issues that are on the table. Yeah. But, but ultimately, let's not, don't, let's not let this fail. Let's make sure this succeeds. Why was there a carve-out for UK financial services? Well, you know, in the end, this is, <laughs> this is not, a, we're not talking about carve-outs here, about specific, acti well, there's a carve-out in terms of pillar one of regulated financial services and of uh, extractive resources, uh, the resources sector. Now, what we're trying to achieve here uh, is uh, to address the risk of tax evasion and tax avoidance in relation to very mobile activities. And in particular, I mean, that's why the digital industry was so much in scope. I mean, the example that was just mentioned, I'm not aware of countries that would tax at 0% businesses in their jurisdiction with physical activity in their jurisdiction as part of an F. I mean, businesses, activities that can't easily shift to another jurisdiction are not the sort of activities that get taxed at 0%. The risk of uh, harmful tax competition uh, is in relation to those activities where countries can structure, where companies can structure their affairs and shift their activities easily around the globe in order to get themselves the best possible tax arrangement. So, here, I mean, we're, we're trying to achieve the right balance, making sure that those companies that are generating profits in market jurisdictions but currently are not uh, paying their fair share of tax in those jurisdictions, that we very much hone in onto those business activities to make sure that they pay their fair share of tax in those markets where their customers are and where they generate their profits. But we don't want to uh, obviously create counterproductive distortions in relation to real activities and substantial activities in mm. economies around the world. Minister, I think that Matthias raised a very, very, raised a very interesting point in that each country is coming with their own different structural setup. Uh, the number, I think you said, was at a, as a proportion of total GDP, only 5% of five it. 5.5% to 6%. 5.5% five, five is coming from tax. And African nations in general rely a lot more on corporation tax than on other types of taxes. Just to give a number that I read, in 2017, African countries raised 19% of their overall revenue from corporation tax compared with an average of just 9% for OECD members. So are a little bit more reliant on those corporate tax revenues. Well, those, those numbers are correct, but also uh, we believe if there's a global initiative, you should consider different sizes of uh, countries that are on the table. Um, why do we have only the largest MNEs in, um, under consideration? Why can't we have another pillar that addresses medium-sized companies, which are the majority of the companies that are operating in our jurisdiction. So if we sign up to this, it means we're excluded from getting taxes from medium-sized companies that we now actually, by our own laws, have an opportunity to collect taxes from. And, and, um, it, and I do understand and, and appreciate your, your situation, Matthias, that progress needs to be made. And uh, we support this initiative. We're on the table. We're just asking for yeah. a reconsideration of some of the commitments that have been made, so that we we're not going to end up we're not going to end up if we sign up to this. Our analysis is we are going to end up with negative tax. So taxes that we used to be able to collect from these medium-sized companies, we cannot collect. The majority of the companies that are uh, in this uh, um, in this in these rules now are not operating in our jurisdictions. So so there's there's a need to reconsider how to make either some amendments or how to add another scope that helps us to capture 
more of the companies mm -hmm. that are operating in developed, uh, developing economies like Nigeria. Is there any overlap between the proposal uh, via the UN, uh, what you're pushing for at the UN level, with the existing OECD proposal? There is, is, but the, the UN uh, proposal is, is, is kind of more straightforward and simplistic, but the limitation it has is it has to be based on, on a bilateral tax treaty. So that's a huge limitation. And we hope also that that can, be, that can be corrected. The complexity, like I said earlier on, is also a, a very important uh, consideration. One of the reasons why we have a lot of profit shifting and tax evasion in our countries is because of the limitation of skills of, of trying to identify these practices, trying to even implement our own laws. So when you are now made to sign or you commit to sign to a process that is complex, you're providing more room for those leakages to happen. The carve outs, I just don't understand why the well, some of the analysis we made from those carve outs, while it is uh, uh, written as 10 percent, could be effectively as low as two to three percent. Mm. So th there's a need for a reconsideration, and it's mm. not to say you can't move forward with the first uh, uh, effort that has been made, but there's a need to quickly look at some other additional variations so that countries like ours, even some of the countries that have signed up to, are also now rethinking. Because when you go to your parliaments, these questions will be asked. Mm -hmm. And how do you get these laws passed in your jurisdictions if the analysis shows that you end up with ne negative revenue inflows as opposed to gains? Very clear. Uh, Gabriel, I want to go back to something you said earlier, which is um, in general, corporate taxes have been dropping since the 80s from about 45 percent to around 20 percent, I think now you said. What I thought is interesting is uh, in the last couple of years, uh, more so than ever, countries have been focusing a lot more on their own fiscal situation. And you can't talk about tax reform without thinking about it through the lens also of the public finances and what uh, pressure countries are under to bolster them. I thought it was notable that in the UK, for example, recently they have actually reversed their policy on corporate taxation. Corporate tax is set to rise from 19 to 25 percentage point. I think only one of, of two OECD countries that has uh, announced such measures in, in recent years. Do you think this era of the race to the bottom on corporate taxation is coming to an end? Unfortunately, no. I, I really wish uh, I could uh, have a more optimistic answer. But what you have to realize is that uh, with the agreement as it's, as, as it's going to be uh, hopefully implemented in, uh, in the near future, um, there is going to be very strong incentives for countries to keep offering low tax rates, tax rates even lower than 15%, to attract activity on their territory. It's true that today there's no uh, uh, country where a lot of, there is a lot of substance, meaning there's a lot of production uh, happening with a 0% tax rate, but we might well go there. Today we have countries where there's a you know, substantial production happening with rates uh, that are below 10%, uh, especially you know, tax rates for income derived from intellectual property with all patent boxes. You know, it's very common to have rates that are 5 6 7%. That's the situation today, and we might even get to, to less than that uh, in the future because the agreement doesn't put a floor to, to tax rates, uh, to how low tax rates can go when firms have real activity. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really concerned about that. And the reason why I'm concerned more broadly is that you have to take you know, the, a bigger perspective on tax systems. The corporate tax is one tax, but you know, it's not the main source of tax revenues, at least in, in most countries. However, the reason why it matters a lot is uh, because it's essentially impossible to have a progressive individual income tax which is in most countries the pillar you know, of tax progressivity, the way we attempt to tax high earners. It's impossible to have a well-functioning individual income tax without a well-functioning and high enough corporate tax. Because if, if, the corporate tax is, uh, if the corporate tax rate is too low, then what happens is that rich people incorporate. They mm -hmm. operate as businesses. They earn income you know, subject to the corporate income, the low corporate income tax rate, and uh, the individual income tax uh, unravels. Mm. And so 
if we want to do anything seriously to uh, curb the rise of income and wealth inequality, it's going to involve progressive taxation, progressive taxation of income in particular, and that needs to uh, uh, involve substantially higher corporate income tax rates. I don't see a future where corporate tax rates remain, you know, 15% uh, or even less <coughs> than that, and we can really tax uh, high income earners uh, at substantially higher rates, I, mm. I think. Uh, and, and so the risk at the end of the day is just mm. to see a continuation of the rise of, of mm. income and wealth inequality that yes. we've witnessed in recent decades. There's an important point here, though. I mean, what we're trying to address with the global tax deal uh, is tax evasion that is facilitated by shifting from country to country. Mm -hmm. I mean, the issues that uh, you raise can be addressed now by individual jurisdictions. I mean, the, the global tax deal that's on the table, the, you know, through the inclusive framework, does not prevent countries from imposing higher corporate taxes. It's a minimum global tax. It does not prevent uh, countries from uh, addressing the risk that you describe of uh, incorporating uh, yourself in order to avoid higher progressive uh, personal income taxes. I mean, these are all things that individual jurisdictions can address for themselves, subject to their de democratic processes. The reason why there's a need for an international agreement to address what we're seeking to address is because of the capacity for big multinational businesses to shift their affairs and to structure their affairs mm. such to essentially pick the jurisdiction that gives them the best deal. And then in the mm. sort of whole process also, I guess, provide, you know, press, put pressure on some countries to offer deals that, quite frankly, are tax wise for. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't think that the right. deal that is on the table of, would prevent individual countries from doing what you're suggesting, yes. if that is what they choose. R respectfully, I disagree with that, because if there's no limit to tax competition, it's very hard for individual countries to increase their corporate income tax rate if firms Mm. can move their factories, can move their headquarters, can move their employment to low tax countries where they will still be subject to tax rates below 15%. So I'm mm. sorry, but this agreement doesn't help countries to increase their corporate income tax rates, unfortunately. Well, substantive activity is not shifted. As no, it but is. That's, the, that's the same problem. It's even worse. You know, shifting paper profits across countries, you no know, pure profit shifting, I agree with you, is going to be very substantially reduced thanks to Pillar 2, and I started my remarks by saying that it's a you know, very important progress, and it's worth celebrating progress when it happens. So pure sh profit shifting, booking billions of dollars in profits in uh, uh, territories where there is no activity, this will come to an end. Those profits will be taxed at at least 15%. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a very good development. Um, however, what is not going to change, what, what's not going to change is that there will remain incentives for firms to move not their paper profits, but their factories, their workers, their headquarters, their real activity to yeah. very low tax countries, including zero tax it's countries. It's going to be and difficult. That's, 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 that's an even that's bigger right. problem. That's it, an even bigger problem. It, it's going to be difficult to come up with a solution on this panel, but also a solution, one solution that works from the very first draft. And this is the first draft of serious international tax reform. And as all of you have said, it is a step in the right direction. But there are a few lingering issues. Um, Faisal, I'd, I'd like to um, sort of round up the discussion with you. Uh, Saudi Arabia is in actually in a, in a special situation, contrary to what Gabrielle just described, because there's no income tax. But there is a high corporation tax. Corporation tax is about 20%, I think, in Saudi Arabia, but of course, no no income tax. How do you think about tax as, as a tool, or maybe a blunt tool, in terms of wealth distribution? So I think um, we have to keep in mind that Saudi uh, managed to uh, increase VAT uh, from 5% to 15% during one of the most challenging times. And, and according to Kristalina yesterday on the Saudi panel, it's virtually the only country that was able to do that successfully. So we look at uh, simplifying uh, tax revenues and utilize them, utilizing them in a way be that was never done before, but not at the expense of economic growth or uh, economic development. So uh, Saudi has been a, a supporter of, of this uh, uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 from the beginning. During the G20 presidency led by Saudi Arabia, 
uh, it was pushed uh, uh, all the way to uh, paving the way for it to be uh, announced during the Italian presidency. I think there are challenges. Uh, one, we need to, as we said, listen to all constituents and leverage multilateral uh, platforms to um, enhance the institutional capabilities of all uh, uh, governments, all players, all partners. I think with better institutional capability, we can shift the focus from minimizing the change or minimizing the impact to where else can we compete. And I think the ultimate long-term effect of all of this is that we will look at uh, competitiveness and fundamentals that will help our economies become uh, more sustainable rather than rely on fiscal incentives that will probably take us nowhere. There's another thing that's uh, uh, challenging in this, and we still think sticking to the frame, time frame is important, is it's, it's complexity. Uh, this is very complex, and it takes time for everyone to understand it, including governments, and to understand where they will, how they will be impacted, uh, uh, where, and to what end. And ultimately, there are always options, but if you extend the investment horizon a little bit and think more long term, I think it, and couple that with raising institutional capabilities everywhere, we can think more broadly about what these uh, can push us uh, to do. But it's very complex. I'm pretty sure if we go to chat GBT, we'll get no answers. <laughs> if you put the, one the, thing uh, they don't have an answer to. The I, other thing, gonna, just one last point. Uh, I think companies say their admin costs related to it, but the structures will shift and will become a little more logical with minimal distortions. It'll cost us mm -hmm. a lot to get there, but a steady state, I think it's more logical. Okay. Well, we've got about six minutes. I want to see if anyone in the audience would like to ask our panelists a question. I'm going to open it up. Yes. My name is David Böcking. I'm a journalist with Der Spiegel in Germany. Um, tax consultants have historically been really good in uh, finding the loopholes in uh, new legislation. How confident uh, are the panelists that this will not happen with uh, this new agreement, especially in developing countries that the tax administrations there have enough resources to actually enforce these rules? Well, I mean, a, a big focus of our work is on uh, supporting capacity development in uh, developing economies. I mean, it is a real issue. There is a real uh, challenge there. And, and that is also why we're having conversations, for example, uh, in relation to the, um, the transfer pricing provisions on simplified arrangements. Um, I mean, it, it is a challenge. It's something that we've, we've got to make sure that we continue uh, to work uh, through. But, I mean, we, we do believe that this is a robust deal. I mean, it is, you know, in the end, if you want to get consensus among uh, 140 odd countries, um, you have to get uh, a lot of different perspectives onto one table. Um, and, you know, in the end, we can say, I, I say it again, I've, I'm repeating myself, uh, we can say, well, let's hold out for the perfect, where we have got no risk and no issues, and, um, but it doesn't happen. Or we can um, go ahead with what is, in my opinion, the best available deal on the table right now, make it work, uh, deliver the additional income, in particular to low-income and middle-income countries, so that they can uh, invest those resources into their economies and into their communities. But, but of course, I mean, you know, th this is to, to, to implement this effectively uh, will take a lot of work, and there is, you know, in particular, a lot of work to be done on capacity development in developing countries. Yeah. Do we have another question? Would you yeah, like to take a crack add, at that? Add, yeah. add to that that I'm actually pretty concerned about this happening because it has happened in the past. So when uh, harmonized transfer pricing regulations were introduced you know, in a number of OECD countries, we saw uh, um, that this was a boon you know, for the transfer pricing industry. We saw an explosion you know, of activity in the transfer pricing industry to find loopholes and very little or sometimes no eff positive effect on tax revenues. And this is a very, very complex agreement, and I'm very uh, concerned that this might play out again uh, in the future. I would just like to add something uh, that you know, uh, relates to the need for unanimity or consensus. All of these discussions start from the premise that we need to have all countries and territories on board. I, we have to question that. Because if we have that approach, in effect, it gives a veto power to countries and territories that benefit enormously from the status quo. 
that benefit from profit shifting, that benefit from tax competition. And that's how, at the end of the day, you have significant loopholes and carve-outs that are introduced with, in, in the agreements. And so there are other ways to proceed. So, for instance, when we look at what happened for uh, uh, bank secrecy, there used to be a strict bank secrecy in countries like Switzerland, in other tax havens, but this changed not because of a you know, change because consensus. Of it stand. changed first and foremost because of the United States, because of unilateral action by the United States you know, in 2010 with the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act that threatened Swiss banks with economic sanctions. And under the, mm. those threats, the banks agreed to cooperate with the US and that it paved the way for a multilateral agreement. But historically, progress often happens like that. There is unilateral action, it could be one country, it could be a, a group of countries, showing that we can do better, better than 15%, could be 25% minimum tax rate, and then it creates a dynamic for ambitious uh, global okay. agreement. We've got about two minutes left. Matthias, I just want you to spell out to the room what you think is at stake if this agreement does not get implemented. Well, what is at stake is about 220 billion dollars in additional revenue that's on the table uh, from Pillar 1 uh, that would benefit uh, all countries, but in particular, except for investment hubs, uh, who lose tax buys and, and, and tax revenues, but which would in particular uh, benefit low-income countries. Um, what is at stake is a f you know, the, the implementation of uh, a reform agreement that would make our international tax arrangements fairer and work better. Mm. Um, will everybody unanimously say this is uh, the perfect thing and the best thing uh, since sliced bread? No. Uh, but uh, is it better than what we currently have? Substantially mm. better, yes. Uh, should we give, I mean, sh I, I would just urge everyone not to give up on this, not to give away this chance to substantially inform, to, to substantially reform the international tax arrangements to make them fairer and work better for the 21st century. Final word for the minister. Well, I just want to appeal to OECD to also make sure that as you're seeking this tax reform, which we agree with, that you're not leaving some countries worse off than they already are or completely leaving out some, some countries uh, in the bargain because I believe with just a little more effort, there can be a way to accommodate some of the concerns that the African countries have. So it wasn't just Nigeria. It was a meeting of African countries mm. that agreed for Nigeria to submit on behalf of African countries the concerns that we have. So it, was, it, it wasn't just Nigeria. Well, look, I'm going to end this by saying at least we're sitting here and having this discussion, and that is a step in the positive direction. Thank you very much. Thank you.